This is the homestead of a very important family that helped shape the 18th century. We're going to cook here today to bring you a taste of history. Welcome, I'm Chef Walter Stape. Today in Taste of History, we play tribute to the early settlers of the 18th century, which was the Germans. You have the German fritters, or also called apple pancakes. You have the ale braised sausage and smashed potato and oysters that everybody kind of would have had. We're gonna do an ale braised sausage that's quite unique. We start off with an all beef sausage. I make myself together with uh, a good colleague of mine and a connoisseur of the 18th century. The only sausage I wouldn't recommend you use is an Italian sausage. Why? Because the fennel uh, that's in there and the different flavors wouldn't make it. But you can use a pork sausage or any sausage like that. What I, what I show you here, any kind of sausage you, that you feel comfortable, a kielbasa would work, anything would work. I just score the sausage like so. It doesn't have to be exact. I just want to make sure that later the ale can penetrate into the, the meat of the sausage. So real simple. You could also just do it like that and you don't have to go the other way around. It's really, quite frankly, it really doesn't make a difference. The, all you want to do is you want to make sure that you penetrate the skin. This happens to be a natural uh, housing. If you do buy a sausage that is in artificial casing, you obviously want to remove that. But in this particular recipe, you don't have to. So it goes like so, very simple, really nothing to it. And I got a pan behind me that is really nice and hot purposely. And in the pan goes the sausage. And with the sausage goes the ale. Now this happens to be today, we're using Thomas Jefferson's ale. That we're using in there. And you want to be very generous with the ale. You don't want to be really stingy on it. I know it's better drinking it than cooking it, but <laughs> in this particular recipe, you want to be generous. Oh, the flavor of that just comes dynamite. So now what we're going to do is we put it back on the fire. We're going to reduce the ale down. When the ale is reduced down, I have some onion that I'm going to cut right now here, and some garlic. I put onions and garlic in, and then afterwards I finish it with any brown sauce, any brown sauce that's available. And what I'll do with the brown sauce, just add it into it, let it simmer, and then last moment I finish it with a very spicy Dijon mustard, which is very, very important. And what is there not to like uh, between Dijon mustard, onion, beer, and sausage? It all fits right beautifully together. Uh, we're serving that with a potato that I call smashed potato. And why I call it smashed potato? Because I don't peel the potato, I leave the skin on it, I boil it, and then I just let it smash it. We're gonna come to that in a little bit. So perfectly, now we got this enough here. Put this right into it. Beautiful. Garlic is very important for this particular dish because you want to get this garlic flavor coming out. Oh yeah. Now, if you want to make this ahead of time, you would take the sausage out when it gets a little brown, finish the sauce, and then later put the sauce on top when you get ready to serve. So that's the idea here. The next step of this uh, recipe, it's a little bit more involved, not really, but it takes a little bit, uh, little bit of muscle. The potatoes oh, should be done. I put them on the fire earlier. Let's see, yep, all right. Now comes the trick, which is uh, an 18th century strainer. What you do is you take a towel, you open the lid, and you take off the water. Okay. Now those are the potatoes I was mentioning earlier. They're Thomas Jefferson's favorite. We call them Irish whites now. They're beautiful. One of the things I do in there now, I put sour cream, plenty amount. Don't be shy in the sour cream. We're not counting calories today. It's all about the taste of history. So <laughs> sour cream was in abundance already, obviously. Or you could use also regular heavy cream. I have chives already chopped. And I got, believe it or not, shallots that are raw, not cooked, this particular recipe. It's very important because you want to get the sweetness from the shallot coming out. 
And once you make this recipe at home, which we sometimes I tell people, this is what you call a baked potato in one, because it has all the same flavors, a little salt, and a little white pepper again. White pepper, because I want no black sparks in it. Okay, now we're gonna, gonna mesh that up. And for the name, mashed potato. So you can take your frustration out on the potato. And I'm sure the 18th century chef had plenty of those, because by the time he made his fire, by the time he did the shopping, I'm sure it took a bit to get everything ready. This is the right consistency almost there like so. All right, the potatoes are ready, just the way I want them. So now I want to put the lid back on there, and I just keep it next to the fire. That's just the beautiful thing about an open fire, because wherever you put something, keeps it nice and warm until such time that you serve it up, which is in this case going to be shortly. I'm going to back on the fire, and in the meantime, my sausage is coming beautiful. Just spectacular, just I want it. What I'm going to do now, and the sausage, perfect. I'm going to add some brown sauce that I already have on the side, and any brown sauce will work for that. You don't have to be being a French chef and making any demi glass. A brown sauce, just like so. There we go. Will be perfect. Perfect, no? All we gotta sip on this together until the flavor comes out, and later, all it gets is a little bit of Dijon mustard, and the main course is gonna be ready. You see the sausages, aren't they magnificent? My friend Walter makes them for me, to my recipes, to my specification. Hey! Bill Gates! Number, nice to see you. The number one sausage maker in the free world. That's me. And, <laughs> and listen, we just got your sausage done. We made a duck sausage for you, which is exquisite. And Marcus is waiting for you in the back. He has everything gonna, ready for you. We're going to be tasting it and see if it's as good as ever. Okay, great. <laughs> it's nice, it's nice to see you. A sausage is only as good as the meat that goes in it. This is beef, pork, and veal. We put the ice on to keep the meat cool as it goes to the emulsifier, because that keeps the temperature down. I was told, and now I'm passing it on to my son, and hopefully maybe someday he will pass it on to his son. We link the sausages, we twist one way, then the other way, so they don't open, and then we, so we can hang them on a smoke stick and put them in the smokehouse. And if you wouldn't do it, it would become one gigantic sausage that nobody would want to buy. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you can't do it anymore? It's been a long time since I've done it, Marcus. I still can do it, but not as good as you. It's tricky, you've got to make sure, like, oh, I busted it, see, now it'd be fired. Marcus, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> because now what you have to do, you have to cut into it, cut into it, and you gotta start from scratch again, which means the whole process stops. It takes a lot of art, a lot of expertise, and I let Marcus do it, because it's much better than I am. I always had a dream, you know, make my own sausage and do the things which I learned in Germany, integrate it in here, and build up a business. I lived the American dream. It's gonna be hung in the smokehouse and then uh, for the smoking process. Now that we completed the task of making the spectacular sausages, I've always wondered, Marcus, what are your secret ingredients? I start with the uh, imported seasonings that I get from Germany. Then I have my own special blend that I mix together. And then uh, I add, you know, the red crushed pepper, the garlic, the paprika, the onion powder, and obviously the salt. So Marcus, uh, what we got here? This is where we're smoking the Bavarian Bierwurst. This we smoke at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. We use a uh, hickory natural smoke chip. You see, it comes out beautiful color and beautiful flavor. Short of modern equipment, nothing has really changed, right? This is the same way that it would have been done hundreds and hundreds of years. The technology now makes the process a little bit quicker, but uh, the procedure is exactly the same. The hickory and the ale and the onion flavor just likes to be married all together. It's a spectacular dish. So, Marcus, now that we have it smoked properly, we got to poach it at 165 degrees. Right here in the spectacular kettle. Here we go. The biggest challenge here is to make sure that you get a temperature of 14 degrees Celsius so the meat will bind. Exactly. And that would have been a big challenge in the early days in the 18th century. They had to make sure they had ice cold water for spring and or ice. Like we know Thomas Jefferson built the largest ice house in 1802 to able to make the sausages that he got experience from Europe. So now let me taste that masterpiece. Go ahead you guys. <laughs> and then we're going to go back to a taste of history where I'm actually cooking with this exact sausage. An ale sausage, 18th century recipe. One of the things that is easy that the 18th century chef had, everybody had a fireplace, everybody had a grill blade, easy. So what was difficult about it? You take some oyster and you pop them open 
me show you that. You can do it at home. If you have your uh, grill, you could do it. And basically all you do, take the oyster out, loosen it from the shell, pile it on the grill. There we go. And I mean, oysters were so in abundance in the Delaware that it's actually, they say that the streets of Philadelphia are paved with oyster shells, and there's no exaggeration to that. So like that. Here we go, another couple of them. Now, if you have trouble doing that, your fishmonger can easily open you some oysters, not a problem. Obviously, I've been doing this for a few years, so get this right open here, one more. Okay. Now, all we're adding into that, real simple, white wine. And salt, it's all it gets, and actually very little salt, because the oysters itself already has salt in the liquid that I have in there, so it doesn't need any much overdoing at all, a little bit. Today, when you look at many recipe books, there's a million different varieties of seasoning that you could put onto it. I would recommend none, because the oyster is beautiful itself. The other thing on this is that you don't want to really overcook that. But you want to make sure that you don't get too much heat on those. I'm going to put it right over here. And you're going to see in a little bit. Soon as they cool a little bit on the bottom, they're done. Look at my sausage. Let me bring it over here so you can see it. Perfect. So what you do with them, a couple of ways you can do it. One, you just take them out. Look how the, the, the opening came about. It's just how I want it. Here we go. And now I can take the uh, Dijon mustard and whisk it under the sauce. Nice. When doing this recipe, you want to make sure that you get a real good Dijon mustard. Extra strong is perfect, like this one over here I'm using. And it's about the right consistency. I wouldn't do any more, any less. Now I'm going to put a sausage bag into it. Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to just bake on the fire for a little bit. The oysters come in perfect. It's just that you actually want them a little raw and just a little bit uh, warm on the bottom. That's perfect. One thing we're going to show you today how to make it really quick is the German fritter, which is very, very, very simple. It's basically a pancake butter, flour, a little bit of uh, baking powder, a couple of eggs, Very important is the uh, nutmeg. That's again one of the connections with the Spice Island. Used a lot, very, very much so in European cooking, Eastern Europe, Germany, everybody. Gets great flavor. A little bit of cinnamon. There we go. And then obviously milk, heavy cream, whatever you want to make to make your apparai. Basically, most everybody knows how to make a pancake. So the the idea of this dough is exactly, should be, the texture of a pancake. I'm going to put a little sugar into it later. The difficult part about this particular recipe is the apple itself. We're going to come to this in a moment. So you see how I whisk it, let it rest for a little bit. It's very important to let it rest. There we go. Okay. Perfecto. Now, the apple. Many apples you can use, there's really no right, no wrong. I mean, if you want to use a Granny Smith, it's any apple you like. It really makes no difference. And the apple you want to do, you want to peel the apple. All right. You want to take an apple core, get down the middle, and want to slice the apple like about half an inch, I would think. It's like about so. And then if you would serve a pancake, three apples would make a perfect location for the pancake. The dough, like I said, is rested really nice. I want to put little pecan nuts in there now. And pecan, obviously, we all know, one of Jefferson's favorite. You want to chop them a little bit. Just get a little bit finer so it's a little easier to, to absorb. And uh, there's not enough can be said about how much Jefferson's pecan nuts. 
Everybody knows how, how much the man fell in love with picanas. He grew them all over, he put them in wherever he could possibly do it. So I would have assumed that this dish also would have made its way all the way down to Monticello, I'm sure. But it's definitely a dish that got served heavy here in Philadelphia because it was cold. And the er early days and the early books referred to it as German fritters. So that's what that was. Here we go. Basically. Now the only thing I've got to do is I want to make sure I got a pan ready. I want to get my other pan. Look at it, how nice the sausages are. Golly, let me get the oysters off. Perfect timing. Take a look at those. See how they cook, how they bubble in the shell? Can you see that? That's how you want them. Look at that. Just like that. Can't get no better than that. Look at that. Ah, oh, it's so gorgeous. Hot, but beautiful. Perfecto. I'm going to come back to those in a little bit. Here we go. Oysters, pièce de résistance, how beautiful. How simple. This is what the 18th century was all about. Simple food. Not too many additives to it. Just clean from the, in this particular case here, from the Delaware, open, quick on the fire everybody had, and voila, you have an appetizer in what? A couple of minutes. My sausages are cooking perfectly. Take my sausage off. Ah. They're perfect. Yep, I'm gonna play them up. So we can see that. And then lastly, I will make the pancake. The 18th century, one thing that I get many questions all the time, people did not eat individual plates. This is a big thing that people ask me, what is Thomas Jefferson ate? What did George Washington eat? What did John Adams eat? I don't know, but I can tell you what's on the table, but I couldn't tell you what they ate. That's a fact, because there was no way for me to know what they pulled off the table. All right, my potatoes I got. Opa. So now, in the true tradition of the 18th century, I will put it together family style, how it exactly would have been served. So I got the mashed potato, or we call it mashed potato. I just put them down the middle of the platter and plenty of it. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Now you don't have to look for Irish whites. You can use Yukon Golds, you can use uh, Red Bliss, you can use even a baking potato. It doesn't make a difference which one you want to use. I just want to be true to the 18th century as much as I can. That's why I used Tef Jefferson's favorite potatoes. And I go and I put my sausage on top. One, two, three, four. And all I got to do now is mix up my sauce which is basically done already. Perfect, it doesn't reduce no more. It doesn't need any more reducing than it is already. And just put a little bit of sauce over. All right. The apple fritters is not simple, <laughs> and, I mean, and I really meant that, because you gotta do a couple things. You gotta first of all have a pan that you wanna make warm, like here. You wanna put butter in there, in the pan, and like so. You want to put butter, and then what you want to do, is you want to take the apples that I caught, and you want to cook them, or I say brown them, a little bit in the middle. You're going to put a little sugar on top of those. Then what you want to do is you want to slightly turn them over, like about so. They're brown really, really, really quick. It's not very difficult. Now, if you like a lot of nuts, you can add some nuts into it at this stage. I have some nuts already in the, in the, in the apparai, or the pancake butter, as you call it. Then the pancake butter would go right on top to cover the, the apple. So you'd go like... There you go. And then it goes back on the fire until they get nice and softly cooked. Okay. Now 
Now, this is a little tricky. You got to be very careful when you do that because you want to make sure they cook nice and easy. You want to make sure they don't cook too fast. And you let the baking powder in it makes it slowly rise, as you're going to see them a little bit. The apple itself, when you start off uh, in a hot, hot, hot pan, doesn't take much time at all because the apple is very tender and really, really quickly gets cooked. So we're going to leave this little bit in there until the dough kind of puffs up a little bit. You can actually see it. Ah. tell you, 18th century was not a piece of cake, I'll tell you, <laughs> for cooking. So it was not simple, to say the least. But again, look at how beautiful my pancake turned out. All I do now is a couple things you can do. And serve with ice cream. Jefferson liked the mint vanilla ice cream and or cinnamon ice cream. Or I can be very simple and very, very, very traditional with some pecans in the middle. Here we go. Now let's just take some powder sugar and just to the, the thing of the play with powder sugar, like that. Very simple, very simple, easy, and voila. All right, this is an 18th century German-inspired meal, no question about it. You have the German fritters, or also called apple pancakes. You have the ale sausage and smashed potato and oysters that everybody kind of would have had. Come with me to the German Society for another taste of history. The first 12 families of German settlers to the United States came to the colonies in 1683 from Krefeld, Germany. Hello, Walter. And settled in a new section of Philadelphia given to them by William Penn called Germantown. At the invitation of William Penn, he said anybody who comes to this country has a right to, to live in freedom. In fact, the very same 13 families here were the signatories of this first attempt to get uh, rid of slavery. The proclamation was written by Francis Daniel Pastorius, the founder of Germantown. I'm going to show you now our library collection here. Mm -hmm. The library was founded uh, about 180 years ago uh, and ha holds over 70,000 German publications. Walter, you asked me how these books uh, came about, yes. the collection. Well, it was the endeavor of the founding fathers of the German society. They wanted to improve life of their own countrymen who came here. We have here the oldest Bible, European Bible that was printed in America. It is the Christoph Sauer Bible, and it was printed in 1743. As you can see, this Bible is a German translation by Martin Luther. And the paper, interesting enough, is made of rags. It lasts much better than modern paper. This uh, probably will last another 500 years. I'll make sure I come back in 500 years to check on it, see if you're right. And you might want to have a look here. This is the Declaration of Independence, a German version of it. And actually, you'll be very surprised. This was printed two days after the 4th of July and published then. And it came ahead of the English version, not because the Germans were faster. The printing date of the then weekly German paper happened to be just two days. So actually, the Germans speaking population of Philadelphia they knew of what was being negotiated there behind closed doors oh, in Independence Hall. Thanks for joining us and sharing a taste of history.